All right, I believe we're recording. I hope you enjoy, uh, welcome, welcome. This is the last class of the summer A session for legal and ethical environment of business. And as you know, Professor Greta Pujol um, and uh, we'll be talking about in this last module, since the class voted by almost a, a simple majority uh, to use the social network and the founding of Facebook as our, if you will, theme of the course, so we could go deeper into some of the legal issues. Uh, though we did talk a little bit about uh, conspiracy, if there whether there was a conspiracy to uh, kill President Kennedy, and we looked at um, to prove a conspiracy, a criminal conspiracy, right? It's a much higher burden of proof. We did talk a, a little bit about the relationship between animals and the law when we looked at the common law, because some of the leading cases there involve, you know, ownership of a wild animal and, um, um, you know, being mauled by a tiger and cattle trespassed. Uh, but let's conclude with Facebook, which is, um, um, as you'll notice in the survey, right, Facebook has rebranded. It's gotten so much bad publicity. It's taken so many hits. Um, and that their uh, Facebook is now, you know, pivoting to something called the metaverse, right? Uh, so they've rebranded their company, uh, Meta Platforms. And if you notice, right, um, Google did the same thing about 10 years ago. Google is now, um, the parent company is called Alphabet Inc. And Alphabet Inc. owns Google Search, right? And all the other uh, features, if you will, and subsidiaries that make up, you know, Google, what we used to call Google or now Alphabet Inc. So meta platforms, right? They own a number of business enterprises, including the original Facebook platform that you saw on the social network, how that platform was founded. Um, and it's really um, rapid, rapid growth and rapid uh, 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 success. Um, now, of course, Facebook also owns the WhatsApp uh, pl texting platform, very popular around the world, right? As it allows you to avoid, uh, you know, texting fees. Um, and um, uh, of course, Instagram, right? Probably the most popular of the Facebook uh, along with WhatsApp. Um, so let's go ahead and um, I, you, um, if you haven't had a chance, you know, go in, do the survey. I'm gonna pull up the survey because then what I'll do is I'll use the survey to talk about three aspects of Facebook's business model today or the meta business model today. Um, now, let me just say that, you know, if time had permitted, I was, uh, considering talking about the metaverse and, you know, like if one avatar attacks another avatar, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, the common law applied to the metaverse like what rules are going to apply uh, this kind of thing. Um, and um, I have to say, I think that's actually very fascinating. Um, very, very fascinating. Um, but that's something that um, um, we'll have to see in the future. You know, we'll have to see in the future. The metaverse really is still um, you know, sort of up and in development. So I'd rather talk about, you know, that if we could have had a, if, if we could have had a seventh class, I would have done about Facebook in the future. Uh, but let's talk about Facebook today. And so with that, what I'll do is I'll do a screen share um, in order to, um, let me pull up the survey, uh, which I should have up. And um, yes, perfect. And then um, what I'll do is we'll look at the survey results um, in order to um, talk about today's topics and look at Facebook today uh, from both legal and ethical perspectives. So let's do this uh, screen share over here. We should be good to go now. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a, um, I'm going to, we'll, we'll jump into survey statistics. All right, I wanted to give you, we have a good sample size. We have about a third, over a third of the class um, participating. As you know, we have one more section later on, um, but the Federal Trade Commission, uh, you may have heard about this. This lawsuit was actually brought back in November of 2020 when Donald Trump was still president. Um, the a federal judge dismissed the complaint in July of, um, uh, of last year, 2021, and um, but permitted the Federal Trade Commission to uh, refile its complaint if it made certain amendments to it and revisions. And that is exactly what the Federal Trade Commission did. Um, and in summary, what their theory of the case is, is that Facebook, by making these acquisitions of uh, very popular um, uh, platforms such as WhatsApp and um, 
um, and um, Instagram, that was an illegal attempt to monopolize the market. So here, what I want to do before we actually discuss this, you know, you know, whether this is a strong case or not, I want to get the classes sense. What do you think about this case? And uh, you know, do you agree with the Federal Trade Commission? And then we'll see. Um, then it'll give me a chance to lecture about some of these um, important antitrust laws. So let's just go see what the class thinks. And um, what's really remarkable is that a um, very impressive majority, almost three quarters, you know, do believe that Facebook has become a monopoly. Yeah, uh, Stefan, uh, go ahead and unmute and jump in here. Honestly, I don't think, I mean, it could be an attempt to monopolize, but there's so many other social media platforms Okay. Yeah, they couldn't even do it if they wanted to do it. Well, this is what we're going to talk about. And this is an, an, an excellent observation because in order to prove a monopoly or even an attempted monopoly, the Federal Trade Commission is going to have to prove two things. Now, this is a civil case, so it's by a mere preponderance, as we saw in our previous class. But they're going to have to prove to prove a monopoly, you have to, or attempted monopoly, you have to prove two things. You have to prove, first of all, that Facebook has market power in the relevant market. And let me talk about that first requirement first, because basically what you have to prove is that you have a big company, you know, a company that, um, you know, a good example here might be Amazon in retail, right? Um, or maybe uh, even better example, Google in search engines, right? A company that completely dominates, right? That has a large amount of market share. Now, what's interesting here is that like the fair use defense in copyright, market power, there is not sort of a specific number that is assigned. Like, oh, if you have more than 50% of the market or 66%, uh, it depends on a whole host of factors. And um, here's the thing though, let's assume well, before, before we assume that Facebook has a monopoly, right? Because you do have other, you do have other um, social media platforms like Twitter and, um, you know, uh, TikTok and uh, Snap, right? But um, if you combine Facebook and Instagram and uh, WhatsApp, you know, uh, uh, you know, Facebook has, you know, a lot of market power. Uh, but notice that's only one requirement, one requirement. Uh, the other requirement is, did you use that market power illegally to harm consumers? So you have to prove the government here, the Federal Trade Commission is going to have to prove two things. By the way, I apologize. I just hear there's some gardeners out in the distance. And so uh, it's going to get a little bit no, uh, no, uh, uh, noisy out here. And so I'll do my best to uh, speak over the sound of the, of the gardening machines and blowers and whatnot. Um, worst case scenario, uh, I'll try to move it outdoors. We'll put out the cigar and move indoors, I should say. But um, um, here is the problem that the Federal Trade Commission is going to have. Even if you can prove that Facebook is a monopoly, has market power in social media market, um, does this harm consumers? And the reason why I say this is difficult and the reason why I give this case a 50-50 probability to go either way is because, um, think about it, right? Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp are all free. Now, I put free in quotation marks because we know it's not really free. We know that you're giving Facebook access to your data so that Facebook can then send you targeted ads, right? That's how Facebook makes their money. That's how Google makes their money as well, right? You give them access to your data, to your search history, to all the stuff you do on the internet, and then they send you targeted ads. And that's how you know, they're able to charge for those targeted ads. But it's free in a nominal sense that you're not required to pay for a subscription you know, in order to access Facebook or use WhatsApp or Instagram for that matter. So this is going to be very difficult, right, in proving harm to consumers. This is a very novel, novel case. Um, I'll just tell you that right now. But let me just go backwards. And even in proving whether Facebook has market power in the relevant market, you have to ask yourself, what is the relevant market here, right? And if the goods are given for free. Um, I want you to imagine Amazon. If you've noticed, both Google, the government has gone after both Google and Facebook for monopoly or attempted monopoly, but it hasn't yet sued Amazon. Amazon is still, you know, there's an investigation going on. 
Um, but let's say the government were to go after Amazon. How do you define the relevant market? If you define the relevant market as just online sales, you know, sales through the internet, probably Amazon has market power in the relevant market. But if you define the relevant market to include all of retail, including sales at physical stores like Walmart, Walmart is still a much larger company with way more employees and way more revenues than Amazon. So notice the court and, you know, whenever somebody brings a the government brings a monopoly case, it first has to decide what the relevant market is. And there the court has to make some judgment calls, you know. Um, and so let me just say this is an uphill battle. But let me just say the reason why I assign 50 50 probability here is because Facebook did bring a motion to dismiss in this case. Facebook did try to get and we as I explained in my previous class. Normally, when somebody files a complaint against you, if you're represented by a good lawyer, they're going to file a motion to dismiss um, in order to delay the time that they have to answer the complaint. Here in this case, however, Facebook lost the motion to dismiss. Uh, the government, I'm sorry, the judge is allowing this case, the second case now to proceed. And so, um, you know, um, there's, you know, a possibility here that this case might even get settled, right? Now that the case is proceeding forward. Or there's a possibility that Mark Zuckerberg may roll the dice and let this case get decided by the courts, which takes me to my next question. What's the worst that could happen, you know, in deciding whether you're going to settle a case or take it to trial, as we saw in our, at the end of last class, you always ask yourself, what's the worst that could happen if I lose this case? You know, if you're Eduardo, you could get zero or maybe one dollar in nominal damages after you paid millions of dollars in legal fees. Right. If you're Mark Zuckerberg and you're being sued by Eduardo counterclaims, uh, the worst that could happen is, is that Eduardo ends up with, you know, the entire company, you know. Uh, so, you know, you think about, you know, what's the worst that can happen, assign a probability value to that and then do what economists call an expected sort of uh, utility, expected value analysis here. Among the worst things that could happen is that the Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp could be broken up into separate company companies. This is exactly what happened in the Microsoft antitrust case from the 1990s. Microsoft actually lost that case and the courts decided that Microsoft and Internet Explorer had to be broken up into two separate companies. At that point in time, Microsoft appealed to the United States Supreme Court and then the government decided to settle with Microsoft out of court and the settlement was Microsoft. We're not going to make you pay any money, but you have to make the source code for Internet Explorer available to all of your competitors, to Google, to Alta Vista, to AOL, whoever had a big search engine back then. Um, and that's exactly what happened. All right, so let's see what the class thinks about this, whether the companies, uh, the, the subsidiary companies should be broken up. And you can see here what's really interesting is you still have a majority favoring breaking up the company, but it's a smaller majority than those that think that Facebook is an illegal monopoly. Now notice what's the other possible remedy. The other possible remedy that Facebook could be required to pay is what the courts call treble damages. It's basically you multiply the amount of money you owe, you know, whatever it is, the jury verdict is, and you multiply that times three. So that's the other possible remedy that could happen in an antitrust case. However, as we saw in uh, the beginning of today's class, um, it's going to be very difficult to prove, not impossible, but it's going to be difficult for the government to prove that Facebook is a monopoly. Because first, we have to define what the relevant market is and does Facebook have enough market share in that relevant market? And then number two is, is there any harm to consumers? And the re by the way, I forgot to explain. The reason why it's so difficult to prove monopoly or attempted monopoly is it goes to a very philosophical principle at the at the heart of the you know system of uh, private enterprise or capitalism, and that is we don't want the courts, we don't want the government, we don't want the law to punish you, a business entrepreneur, just because you're successful, right? The reason why you might have market power in the relevant market, right? The reason why it might look like that you're a monopoly is because people just prefer your products, right? 
you provide better goods at a better price. And so you're successful because you deserve to be successful. It's only when you're big, you know, you have monopoly power in whatever the relevant market is, the court will have to decide that as a matter of law. It's only if you then, uh, the government can then prove that consumers are harmed by the exercise of your market power. Generally, that would mean higher prices than what the competitive price would be. Uh, here, the price is nominally zero, right? So um, now I will tell you, the FTC is arguing that in this case, the harm to consumers is Facebook's data privacy policies. That Facebook doesn't really live up to its data privacy policies. And so there, I think the FTC might have actually a very strong case, to be honest with you. That's why I would not be surprised if Facebook were to, were to decide to settle this out of court, to be honest with you. But, but that's a tough, yeah, that's a, that's a business decision more than a legal decision. All right, let's go to the next part of the class. And that is, I want to talk about something that Facebook has done. Um, whether you think Facebook is bad in the monopoly um, or, um, or whether you like Facebook, I want to speak sort of um, something that a creative that Facebook has done. Um, I have studied this, presented about this, uh, so I, I will tell you here, I, uh, I, uh, this is an area where I definitely know what I'm talking about, and that is um, Facebook has decided to fund and create an independent oversight board. And when you look at the details, you know, yeah, it's being paid by Facebook, so you can question the, how independent it really is, but it is set up as a separate business entity. And the person that Facebook appointed to run this separate business entity is a very well-respected person. And he, in turn, has appointed 20 very um, um, uh, famous people. Uh, he's appointed a professor of First Amendment law at Stanford Law School, William McConnell. He's appointed the former prime minister of Denmark. I, I, uh, um, he's appointed you know, a lot of reputable people from the world of government and law and uh, the academy. And what the oversight board does is it has powers to review Facebook's content moderation policies as takedown policies when somebody is deplatformed. De 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 so the most famous example of somebody being censored or deplatformed, right, is going to be Donald J. Trump uh, right after the January 6th revolt, if you will. And um, what happened here is that um, once Facebook made the decision, right, it decided to refer its own decision to the oversight board. And the oversight board did something that was um, interesting. It upheld Facebook's decision, right, saying that the decision to deplatform Trump or censor Trump was within Facebook's content moderation policies that don't allow the incitement of violence. However, however, it was against due process to make the penalty, the deplatforming, the suspension, to make it indefinite. That was against a due process. You have to specify the penalty, whether it's one month, 10 years, or whatever in between. And so Facebook then went back, and Mark Zuckerberg personally made the decision to deplatform Trump until December 31st, 2023. So almost two full years. So what does the class think about this? Is this the right penalty? Is it too little, too much, or is it the right penalty? Like the Goldilocks, you know, Goldilocks parable. You can see the results for yourself. Um, only about 20%, 19% think that, that this is too short. 35% um, think it's too long, but almost half the class think it's, a, it's the right penalty, you know? So, I say this because, you know, maybe the oversight board, you know, it's very novel. Normally, and this is going to go to the next question. Normally, it's the board of directors that sets policy for a corporation. And it's the CEO and the management team that um, actually then implements these, uh, the policies, you know. And so what Facebook has done here is saying, you know, we're going to give, we're going to allow the oversight board to actually review our decisions and overrule our content moderation policies. Um, now, let me tell you, um, the, that said, the powers of the oversight board are limited. The oversight board cannot rewrite Facebook's content moderation policy. It can only determine whether Facebook has correctly exercised 
you know, its decisions under its own moderation, content moderation policies. So it's still, you could say, a very limited, you know, jurisdiction that the oversight board has. But nonetheless, I, I will say to Facebook's credit, no other company has even attempted this, you know, to create an independent entity that could theoretically overrule Facebook's own decisions. All right. The next question here is, um, oh, by the way, do you like the idea of an oversight board? Should other companies, you know, follow Facebook's lead here? Now, what I have here is how corporate governance actually works today. Like I said, the oversight board is a uh, narrow experiment. You know, never been really tried before. Um, normally, right, you have these external governance. You could have these pressure groups, you know, that could go to the media and try to, you know, um, put pressure from outside the company. But within the company, right, the owners being the shareholders, they elect the board of directors, right? And then the board of directors sets the company policy. Now, those of you studying accounting, right, it's required now after the Sarbanes-Oxley, you have to have an external auditor, right, uh, um, uh, 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 overviewing, uh, you know, uh, the, the company. But the external auditor, of course, is paid by the company. So it's kind of a hybrid, you know what I mean? in that, uh, but, it's, uh, but it is considered an external auditor that uh, um, cannot have a conflict of interest in its other uh, uh, um, accounts with that company. So uh, let's see what the class thinks about this. Um, and um, so notice a lot of the class actually likes the idea and that, um, uh, you know, maybe we need to encourage, maybe we need to look at legal avenues of requiring companies to have oversight boards um, in or and giving them some limited jurisdiction at least to review. Um, others would say though here it's only one third, you know, this should be purely voluntary. Let the market, you know, the market will take care of it. If this is really such a good idea, other companies like Google will follow suit, you know? If it's not a good idea, then why do we want to require companies to do it? You know, we have to look at the details here. Well, let me tell you an example currently pending before the Congress of an attempt to actually more directly regulate big companies. And so this is gonna be the last part of today's lecture. And I wanna mention this because although personally, I don't think the Accountable Capitalism Act has a very high probability of being enacted, to be honest with you, given the fact that the Republicans are probably gonna win control of the Congress. And given the fact that any legislation, even today, require 60 votes because of the filibuster rules in the United States Senate. You know what I mean? You would need at least 10 Republicans to support the Accountable Capitalism Act. So, um, but that said, I do think the Accountable Capitalism Act does raise some really important issues that are going to be at the center of, of, our, of, of politics and that will be debated in the years to come, you know? And that I do believe that even if the Accountable Capitalism Act may have a low chance of being approved right now, I think some form of the bill might eventually become enacted into law once the next big corporate scandal erupts, you know? So um, that's why I want to talk about this, because this is looking a little bit towards the future. But because this bill is before Congress, um, you know, I, we can talk about it now. Now, what the bill would do, it does three big things. Um, number one, it overrules Citizens United. Citizens United is a decision by the United States Supreme Court that basically strikes down any attempt to regulate um, campaign contributions by uh, private corporations. So this law would say, no, we're going to set limits to how much, uh, actually, we're going to prohibit campaign contributions altogether. Uh, part two is it would have... Um, um, it, would, uh, it would allow the workers to elect 40% of the board of directors. Right now, only the shareholders elect the board of directors. And finally, the bill would implement something called the stakeholder model of business ethics, which I'll say a little bit more. But the stakeholder model, if we could just simplify it, is that when the business is making a decision, whether to relocate overseas, whether to launch a new product, whether to rebrand, you know, you have to take into account not just the shareholders, right? You have to take into account everybody else who's affected by your decision, your employees, 
your customers, your suppliers, all your stakeholder groups. A stakeholder is simply a group of people who would be affected by your decision. Arguably, you could argue in some companies that are involved in potential polluting activities, the environment has a potential stakeholder. You know, uh, the local communities in which, in which a business operates could be considered a stakeholder. Now, before I do release the results, I forgot to put here that this bill is limited in scope in that it only applies to, uh, like I say, large corporations, and that's defined as companies that make a billion dollars or more in uh, revenues per year. I looked it up, it's about 3,000 companies doing business in the United States to which this law would apply. Let's see what the class thinks, if they like this bill or if they don't like it. Notice, right, uh, this is probably the highest majority we've seen all semester. The vast majority of the class are for the bill, you know, like the bill or this maybe one aspect of the bill. Yeah, Stefan, um, go ahead and unmute yourself and jump in here. Yeah, I was actually against the bill. And the reason is because um, a lot of companies are doing that already. Good point. They already, you know, they take into account all the shareholders, not just the, you know, the actual shareholders, but all the stakeholders of the company. And I feel like they shouldn't be forced upon, like upon the big corporation, they should make that decision based on the market and the comp the competition between the big corporations, if it makes sense. And by the way, in fairness, this bill might be purely symbolic as a way of getting companies to voluntarily enact some of these reforms. Or you can even say the oversight board, right, is a good example of moving in the direction towards the bill. But let me actually, I agree with what you're saying, but let me push back as a lawyer, you know, law professor, I'm accustomed to being devil's advocate. Our companies do say, and in fact, you're right, um, during the pandemic, the so-called group called the Business Roundtable, which is made up of the CEOs of these big companies, you know, that make a billion dollar or more, they issued a press release last fall saying that they were going to voluntarily adopt the stakeholder model of business, you know? So you're absolutely right. You could, you could argue the, the bill is superfluous. You know, let's allow the market to work and companies will voluntarily do the right thing, you know? But here's my pushback. Let me show you Facebook's current board of directors. Um, and, um, oh, by the way, let me do a screen share for this. Now, you may be aware of the management team. I believe Sheryl Sandberg is about to step down, uh, but you know, Mark Zuckerberg is still the CEO of Facebook. Um, you have Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, you have this guy, Clegg. Uh, you have uh, the CFO, uh, Wayner. You have this guy, Bonsworth, who's a technology officer. Cox, a product officer. Um, there's a, a chief business officer. It's a, a, you know, quite an impressive management team. Jennifer Newstead, we went to law school together. She is the chief legal officer of Facebook. Um, I find that remarkable, you know, uh, that one of my own classmates is on Facebook's management team. But now look at their board of directors. Zuckerberg's on the board. Sandberg is on the board. Peggy Alford. Um, Peggy Alford uh, is on the board of uh, pay, uh, uh, PayPal. And... Um, uh, and she, you know, so she has a lot of experience um, and she's on Facebook's board. Um, Mark Andreessen, he's this internet guru. He co-created the Netscape browser, which revolutionized the internet. In fact, the reason why the government brought an antitrust action against Microsoft was because uh, Microsoft, when they introduced Internet Explorer, uh, the government alleged that the harm to consumer was that this was designed to uh, basically uh, harm consumers by um, uh, uh, by trying to uh, squeeze out the Netscape browser. But anyways, he's on the board of directors. Um, Andrew Houston, um, he's the founder of Dropbox. He's on the board of directors. Um, I could go on and on. By the way, let me give a credit to Facebook. This is a very diverse board. You know, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, and this I think is the main problem with the social network as a movie, 
It's a very sexist and misog misogynistic movie. You know, no women have any leading roles in that one in that movie. Now, one of the reasons why I still assign the movie is because um, I actually want to bring that to your attention. This is a problem not so much with the movie and Hollywood double standards hypocrisy, but it's also a problem in Silicon Valley. And you, know, you could argue the big you know, companies themselves, right, that don't give as many opportunities to women as they do to other people and other groups. And so Facebook is a very, you know, um, but notice uh, is a very has a very progressive, diverse board. Um, you see this guy, he was ambassador to Germany. Uh, see this lady, uh, she was at the Estee Lauder company, you know, so she knows the female market. Uh, here's the newest board member, the guy, the DoorDash uh, 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 founder. So, you know, um, uh, Facebook's board is very, very progressive, you know, very diverse, right? Uh, an amazing amount of people on that board of directors. But I want you to remember the Sherlock Holmes story of the dog that did not bark. Who, who is not on that board of directors? Who do you not see on that board of directors? I'm gonna tell you right now, you don't see a single rank and file employee on the board of directors. So to me, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. You know what I mean? Whether you like the Accountable Capitalism Act or don't like it, you know, the truth is the companies are saying that they are adopting the stakeholder model of business as ethics. But in reality, and I don't mean to pick on Facebook, because this is true of every single Fortune 500 company. If I were to show you the board of directors of every single major company in the United States, the same thing would be true. Not a single worker on a single board of directors. You know what I mean? Um, and so, um, you know, I, I got to be honest, the one thing I like about Senator Warren and AOC is that, you know how they say, I'm going to call your bullshit. If you're a company and you're saying you're about the stakeholders and you don't have a single worker on your board of directors, think about like, think about UCF board of trustees, right? Think about, um, what if, uh, you know, um, you know, think about there's a student vote and voice on that, on that board of directors, the SGA president, right? You know, how can you say you're, you're, you, 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 you care about the students if you don't even give the students a voice on your board of trustees, which would be the equivalent of the board of directors, right? So I think the, this is why I think the Accountable Capitalism Act is actually um, going to generate a very valuable debate in the years to come. One of the interesting thing, th things is, if you may allow me to mention Donald J. Trump again, think about how he got elected in the first place, 2016, when he bullied Ford Motor Company for basically moving their F-150 or threatening to move their F-150 Ford truck uh, production facility, their factory into Mexico. You know what I mean? That factory is actually located, would have been located in Kentucky, you know? And, you know, Kentucky, right? That's a pivotal state, you know, Ohio is right there as well. You know, Michigan, think of all the states, right? Where all these companies have relocated, you know, to China, uh, Mexico, other countries, you know? Uh, now, you may have a global sense of ethics where you can say there's no problem with that. But I will say that one of the interesting things is that Donald Trump, right, is in many ways the best spokesperson you could have for stakeholder ethics, you know, for, hey, at least, at least take into account the employees when you make a decision, you know what I mean, before you make the decision. So that's why I say the Accountable Capitalism Act could possibly, if it's, if it's maybe rewritten, it could possibly generate bipartisan support, you know. Possibly, you know, um, just because the companies, they say they're about the stakeholders, not just the shareholders. But in reality, all you see on the board of directors are these big shots, you know, people who are on the boards of other big companies. And uh, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be on the board because they have a lot of experience. In the Facebook's case, they have a lot of founders of companies like DoorDash and Dropbox and PayPal. You know, they have a lot of important you know, people there that are uh, Anderson with Netscape. Um, but um, you know, I just want to throw that out there, you know, why I think this is going to be a very important conversation in the years to come. Um, is capitalism really fair? Finally, what I want to do is I want to do the last survey question here. And the last survey question, let me just pull that up here. Um, let, me, let me go back to the screen share uh, functionality. And I want to end the course on this last uh, survey question is um, if any of you take a course in cinema or literature, there, there generally has to be a conflict situation. And generally the conflict situation is set up either by nature or by a villain. So who is the villain in the social network? You know, um, who is the bad guy? 
One of the most fascinating aspects of the social network from a purely artistic perspective is that you could argue that every single individual, you know, protagonist did bad stuff, unethical stuff, you know, and potentially even illegal stuff, like in the case of Mark Zuckerberg. Um, but you know, it's really interesting here. Look, there's no question about it, right? If you have to pick one person, you're going to pick Mark Zuckerberg because, you know, he stole an idea, you know what I mean? Um, seemed to stab these other guys in the back, betrayed his best friend, you know, even, even actually served them with the complaint to get that strategic advantage to have the lawsuit be fought in California, not in South Florida. Um, and what I want to end with you on this is this is, um, look at what these uh, potential villains, uh, you know, look at what, the, now this, this list I'm about to show you is from 2012 when Facebook became a publicly traded company. So I don't know, you know, um, I don't know how many shares Peter Thiel has sold since then, but at the time, 2012, when Facebook went public, when it became a publicly traded corporation, Peter Thiel was the seventh biggest investor in Facebook and his investment was worth $2.5 billion. You could argue he's the bad guy because he's the one who kind of plots, you know, uh, Eduardo's uh, demise, if you will, you know, from the company, you know, let's set this up as a Delaware corporation and then let's dilute Eduardo's shares. All that's basically Peter Thiel's idea. Um, number six is Sean Parker. You could, you could argue that Sean Parker, you know, you could say he's a good guy, but he's made some bad choices in his life, you know, doing drugs or, you know, uh, partying with underage girls, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, but look at, look at where he's at. You know what I mean? Um, he was at one point Facebook's president until he was charged with drug possession. Um, in the movie, it didn't really happen the way it showed in the movie. Um, what, it was actually in North Carolina. He was, uh, uh, kite surfing with a bunch of friends and the police raided their Airbnb because they were making, there was a party there, they're making a lot of noise and they found drugs. Now the, the, the charges were ultimately dropped. You know what I mean? So I don't know if those were Sean Parker's drugs or somebody else's, you know, but you know, all the bad publicity caused, um, uh, Zuckerberg to basically say, I'm going to have to fire you from the company. I'm not going to take away your shares because you, and, and by the way, think about it. Why does Sean Parker get 4% of the company worth $4 billion in 2010, uh, 2012? By the way, assuming he hasn't sold any shares, today's Facebook shares sell at over $300. Back in 2012, the market price was $40. So this is, you know, assuming he hasn't sold any shares, you do the math, right? There's like a $20 billion, you know, uh, equity stake. Um, well, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? It was Sean Parker who put Peter Thiel in touch with um, Mark Zuckerberg. That's why I want you to do peer reviews. That's why I want you to know other people in the class because um, that's why I want you to work in groups because it's not what you know, it's who you know, you know? And Sean Parker's biggest, single biggest contribution to the company was you know, getting rid of the word the and putting uh, Mark Zuckerberg in touch with Peter Thiel. Um, look who's number um, five on the list, right? Eduardo and Zuckerberg basically settled out of court. And we don't know it was a confidential settlement, but we do know that when Facebook went public, Eduardo ended up with 5% of the company worth $5 billion back then. Now, um, I think Eduardo probably sold his shares because subsequent to this, he decided to relocate to Singapore and renounce his American citizenship. I thought that, you know, in order to not, not pay uh, US taxes, Personally, I thought that was a bad decision because although I think Singapore is a great place to live, it's a beautiful place. Um, I thought it was a bad decision because the movie gave him like a lot of goodwill. A lot of people said, yeah, you know, Eduardo was kind of screwed over by Mark Zuckerberg. But once Eduardo renounces his U.S. citizenship, it sounds like he's being kind of ungrateful, you know, to the country that took his family in. And you're not paying your fair share of taxes. What? You know what I mean? So he lost all of that goodwill. But notice what the settlement value was. The settlement was, is you're going to get everything we're going to give to Sean Parker and a little bit more, you know, if you walk away from the lawsuit. So Eduardo, now you could argue Eduardo's the bad guy here, not Zuckerberg. Remember Ronald Coase and the cattle trespass? It's a reciprocal problem. Eduardo, if you hadn't gone to New York, if you had gone to California with Zuckerberg, you know, if you hadn't frozen the bank account without any warning, you know, if you hadn't, you know, if you hadn't been such a jerk yourself, None of this would have happened. And let me say, one of the things I like about um, Jesse Eisenberg's performance in The Social Network is that although, yeah, 
he comes across like a douche, you know, double crossing all of these friends he has. But you can tell he's a bit conflicted by it, you know. And in real life, all of the discovery documents we have from that case is that Zuckerberg was very reluctant to actually go along with his lawyers in serving Eduardo, but he ultimately accepted their advice, you know, to get the leverage in the case. Uh, but he actually was very reluctant in real life and knew what he was doing was maybe, if not illegal, it was maybe had some moral implications. Uh, but um, look at here. Uh, well, this guy was a uh, um, the second outside investor after Peter Thiel. Uh, so he got a big chunk of the company. Uh, look at number three. I haven't talked about Dustin Moskovitz. You know where he was born? Alachua County, Gainesville, Florida. You know where he grew up? Ocala. He's a central Floridian. And he was part of the initial Facebook founding group. He left in 2008 to start his own company called Asana, which is like a Facebook for private companies. Um, but look at he was handsomely rewarded for being there at the beginning. And this guy's from Central Florida, you know, could have been one of us. Um, number two, oh, Excel Partners is the other initial investor. And by the way, Excel Partners and Jim Breyer is the reason why Eduardo had to get it diluted. Because to bring in the new investors, such as Excel Partners and such as um, uh, the, uh, the Digital Sky Group, uh, you know, somebody had to get diluted, right? And so instead of diluting everybody equally, let's just dilute Eduardo and bring in our new investors that way in the Series A and Series 2, you know, Series B uh, round of um, uh, funding. But look who's on top of the list, right? This comes as no surprise, right? Um, what's really remarkable here is that even though the vast majority of the class would say, 66%, you know, would say that Zuckerberg is the villain, he's out here on top. And so this is where I like to say that, you know, um, if you believe in karma, this shouldn't be much of a problem because eventually this is all going to catch up to Mark Zuckerberg as it has now begun to catch up to Mark Zuckerberg, right? On the other hand, to give Mark Zuckerberg a lot of credit, I think one of the reasons why he's still on top is because he has made a lot of good business decisions. The acquisition of WhatsApp and Instagram, right? The decision to, um, uh, uh, you, you know, expand his company. Um, move into the metaverse and try to be the first company in that space. You could say these are all risky gambles, but in the past, he's made good decisions. And those good decisions from a business perspective, right, have apparently outweighed, um, you know, uh, what, what all the, you know, the creation of the oversight board. I have to give him credit for that, you know, actually being willing to say, you know what, we'll allow an independent entity that we're, I'm going to pay for myself, but we'll allow that independent entity to review my most controversial decisions. You know, that's a step in the right direction, you could argue. Um, let's conclude the course. Uh, we, we are um, uh, trying to remember um, here. Oh, it looks like a, this will be a short class then. I thought I, was, um, I thought I was behind schedule. So what I will do now is I just wanna conclude on that note. I'll let you draw your own conclusions, right? Um, Adam Smith, who um, I consider myself a student of Adam Smith, um, Adam Smith famously said, you know, how do you know when something is right and wrong? And he said, well, you have an impartial spectator. You imagine somebody, a neutral judge, you know, reviewing your decisions. And what would that judge say about what you're doing? You know, and so, um, you know, you could perhaps apply the impartial spectator, not just to your own actions, but actions of leading business figures. Uh, but to sum up, then we looked at three things, you know, we looked at antitrust law. And we saw the bottom line lesson there is that it's very difficult to actually prove a monopoly because not only do you have to prove market power in the relevant market, right? Um, but you have to prove that there's a harm to consumers uh, resulting from that, uh, that, um, uh, yeah, that exercise of market power. We saw the creation of Facebook's oversight board, um, which is actually a very novel um, idea. Nobody's ever tried it before. Facebook set up a separate trust a separate business entity and gave them limited power um, to review some of Facebook's content moderation policies. Though it's a limited uh, review power, no other company has allowed, you know, an independent entity to actually, you know, overrule its own decisions. And finally, we saw the Accountable Capitalism Act that um, though it's, um, you know, it's interesting, Bernie Sanders uh, has not co-sponsored the bill perhaps because he wants to you know, run for president again and doesn't want to give Senator Warren, who also probably wants to run for president, perhaps there's some political factors there. But regardless of you know, what happens to the bill, you know, it does generate some interesting questions. 
Why is it that companies don't have more diverse board of directors, not just in terms of gender and, you know, ethnicity and those kind of things, race, but what about having some of your, a customer on the board, a worker on the board, rank and file, an employee, um, you know, other people that your business, that your business affects. Why not give them, I'm not saying give them majority, but give them at least a voice. You don't even have to give them a vote, give them a voice. There's nothing in Delaware law, in the state laws of all, uh, you know, uh, uh, cor general corporation law of all 50 states preventing companies from doing that, you know? So it's possible that the Accountable Capitalism Act may move companies in that direction. Um, and so that will remain to be seen. Um, with that then, that does conclude our semester. Um, we are now, um, now you're, you know, free to, uh, uh, free to leave. Uh, thank you for the honor of being able to teach you this semester. I hope you have the big picture now of you know, the main sources of law and how the law is a seamless web. You have now an introduction to the common law and how essential property rights, contract rights, and tort law, injury law are you know, the background rules in which business operate that are provided by our common law tradition. You've now seen intellectual property or the law of ideas, how every single product or service embodies a set of ideas and the law allows you to, allows a business firm to actually assert its ownership interest over the idea itself or over the expression or marketing of that idea. Then we saw civil and criminal cases, but specifically we saw the fundamental idea of due process, how it's the person making the accusation that has the burden of proof and how the burden of proof varies depending on what type of case it is and at what stage the case is. Lastly, we saw um, just now Facebook today and how it continues to raise all of these novel issues such as is Facebook a monopoly? Is um, the Facebook oversight board, should it be extended to other companies perhaps? Why doesn't Twitter do this? Um, and uh, then we saw the uh, bill pending before Congress, the Accountable Capitalism Act, that uh, is an attempt to make, if you will, capitalism more fair. You know, is that, the, is that should we require that legally? or should the stakeholder model also be purely voluntary? That will be the discussion in the years to come. You, you know, you're free to make up your own mind. You know, these are very contested, hot issues. That's why I've always chosen questions that are not yet decided by the Supreme Court. With that, that concludes our, our semester. What I'm going to do is end the recording and then open it up to questions, comments, or concerns that you may have. I see the chat's pretty active um, and I'll be more than happy to stay you know, and, and address your questions.